Well, there's uh, two categories of folks that you outline that uh, that worry about or highlight the risks of AI, and you highlight a bunch of different risks. I would love to go through those risks and just discuss them, brainstorm which ones are serious and which ones are less serious. But first, the, the Baptists and the bootleggers. What are these two interesting groups of folks who uh, who who worry about uh, the effect of AI on human civilization? Or say they do. Say, say oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll say they do. <laughs> the Baptists worry, the bootleggers uh, say they do. Yeah. Um, so the Baptists and the bootleggers is a metaphor from economics, um, from what's called development economics. And it's this observation that when you get social reform movements um, in a society, um, you tend to get two sets of people showing up arguing for the social reform. Um, and the, the, the term ba Baptists and bootleggers comes from the American experience with alcohol prohibition. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in the 1900s, 1910s, um, there was this movement that was very passionate at the time, which basically said alcohol is evil uh, and it's destroying society. Um, by the way, there was a lot of evidence to support this. Um, there were very high rates of uh, very high correlations then, by the way, and now uh, between rates of physical violence and alcohol use. Um, almost all violent crimes have either the perpetrator or the victim or both drunk. Almost all, if you see this actually in the work, almost all sexual harassment cases in the workplace, it's like at a company party and somebody's drunk. Like it's, it's amazing how often alcohol actually correlates to actually just dysfunction. It leads to domestic abuse mm -hmm. um, and so forth, child abuse. And so you had this group of people who were like, okay, this, this is bad stuff and we should outlaw it. And, and those were quite literally Baptists. Those were mm -hmm. super committed, you know, hardcore Christian activists in a lot of cases. There was this woman uh, whose name was Carrie Nation, um, who was this older woman who had been in this, you know, I don't know, disastrous marriage or something. And her husband had been abusive and drunk all the time. And she became the icon of the Baptist uh, uh, prohibitionists. And she was legendary in that era for carrying an ax um, and doing, you know, completely on her own, doing raids of saloons and like taking her ax to all the bottles nice. and kegs. In yeah. the back. And, and so, so a um, true believer, an absolute true believer, um, and with absolutely the purest of intentions. And, and, and again, it, there's a very important thing here, it, which is there's, you could look at this cynically and you could say the Baptists are like delusional, you know, extremists, but you can also say, look, they're right. Like she was, you know, she had a point, yeah. Yeah. like she wasn't wrong, um, about a lot of what she said. Yeah. But it turns out the way the story goes is it turns out that there were another set of people who very badly wanted to outlaw alcohol in those days. And those were the bootleggers, which was organized crime that stood to make a huge amount of money if legal uh, alcohol sales were banned. Um, and this was, in fact, the way the history goes is this was actually the beginning of organized crime in the U.S. This was the big economic opportunity that opened that up. Um, and so they went in together, um, and, and oh, they didn't go in together. Like <laughs> the Baptists did not even necessarily know about the bootleggers because they were on their moral crusade. The bootleggers certainly knew about the Baptists and they were like, wow, this is, these people are like the great front people for like, yeah. our, you know, it's good PR. shenanigans in the, in the background. Yeah. And they got the Volstead Act passed. Right. And they did in fact ban alcohol in the U S and you'll notice what happened, which is people kept drinking. Mm -hmm. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> people kept drinking. Um, the bootleggers made a tremendous amount of money. Um, and then over time it became clear that it made no sense to make it illegal and it was causing more problems. And so then it was revoked. And here we sit with legal alcohol a hundred years later with all the same problems. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, you know, the whole thing was this like giant misadventure. Uh, the Baptists got taken advantage of by the bootleggers and the bootleggers got what they wanted. And, and that was that. The same two categories of folks are now uh, sort of suggesting that uh, uh, the development of artificial intelligence should be regulated. 100%. Yeah, it's the same pattern. And, and the, the, the economists will tell you it's the same pattern every time. Like, this is what happened with nuclear power. This is what happened, and, which is another interesting one. But like, yeah, this is this happens dozens and dozens of times um, throughout the last hundred years. And, and, and this is what's happening now. And you write that it isn't sufficient to simply identify the actors and impugn their motives, we should consider the arguments of both the Baptists and the bootleggers on their merits. Yeah. So let's do ju just that. Yeah. Risk number one. Uh, will AI kill us all? Yes. So <clears throat> uh, what, do you, what do you think about this one? This, this, what do you think is the core argument here? that uh, the development of AGI, perhaps better said, uh, will destroy human civilization. Well, first of all, you just did a sleight of hand because we went from talking about AI to AGI. <laughs> Is there a fundamental difference there? I don't know. What's AGI? I, what's AI? What's intelligence? Well, I know what AI is. AI is machine learning. What's what's AGI? I think we don't know what the bottom of the well of machine learning is or what the ceiling is. Because right. just... Uh, to call something machine learning or just to call something statistics or just to call it math or computation doesn't mean, you know, uh, nuclear weapons are just physics. So it's, it, 
it's to me it's very interesting and surprising how far machine learning has taken. No, but we knew that nuclear physics would lead to weapons. That's why the scientists of that era were always in some of this huge dispute about building the weapons. This is different. Asia is different. Where does machine learning lead? Do we know? We don't know. But this, my point, is different. We we actually don't know. But and and this is where you the sleight of hand kicks in, right? This is where it goes from being a scientific topic to being a religious topic. Um, and, and that's why that's why I specifically uh, called out that because that's what happens. They do the vocabulary shift, and all of a sudden you're talking about something totally that's not actually real. Well, then maybe you could also, uh, as part of that, define the Western tradition of millennialism. Yes, end of the world, apocalypse, apocalypse, what is it? apocalypse cults, um, apocalypse cults. Well, so we live in a, we of course live in a Judeo Christian, but primarily Christian kind of saturated, you know, kind of Christian post Christian secularized Christian, you know, kind of world uh, in the West. Um, and of course, core to Christianity is the idea of the second coming and, and, and you know, the revelations and, you know, Jesus returning and th the thousand year, you know, utopia on earth and then the, you know, the rapture and like all, all that stuff. You know, we don't, we, you know, we collectively, you know, as a society, we don't necessarily take all that fully seriously now. So what we do is we create our secularized versions of that. We keep, we keep looking for utopia. We keep looking for, you know, basically the end of the world. And so, what what you see over over decades is that basically a pattern of these sort of of these of these of, of is this this is what cults are. This is how cults form as they form around some theory of the end of the world. And so, the People's Temple cult, the Manson cult, the Heaven's Gate cult, the David Koresh cult. You know what they're all organized around is like there's going to be this thing that's going to happen that's going to basically bring civilization crashing down. And then we have this special elite group of people who are going to see it coming and prepare for it. And then there are the people who are either going to stop it or are failing stopping it. They're going to be the people who survive to the other side and ultimately get credit for having been right. Why is that so compelling, do you think? like Because uh... it satisfies this very deep need we have for transcendence and meaning that got stripped away when we became secular. Yeah, but why, why does the transcendence involve the destruction of human civilization? Because like how like how plausible it's it's like a very deep psychological thing because it's like how plausible how plausible is it that we live in a world where everything's just kind of all right right how exciting yeah, wait, 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 how wait, exciting is that right but that's I we want that, more than that but, but that's the deep question i'm asking right. why is it not exciting to live in a world where everything's just all right because <laughs> i think um uh, you know most of the animal kingdom would be so happy with just all right yeah because that means survival why are we, uh, maybe that's what it is. Why are we conjuring up things to worry about? So C.S. Lewis called it the God-shaped hole. Mm -hmm. So there's a God-shaped hole in the human experience, consciousness, soul, whatever you want to call it, where there's got to be something that's bigger than all this. Yeah. There's got to be something transcendent. There's got to be something that is bigger, right? Bigger, a bigger purpose, a bigger meaning. And so we have run the experiment of, you know, we're just going to use science and rationality and kind of, you know, everything's just going to kind of be as it appears. And a large number of people have found that very deeply wanting and have constructed narratives. And, and by the way, this is the story of the 20th century, right? Communism, right? Was one of those. Communism was a, was a form of this. Uh, Nazism was a form mm -hmm. of this. Um, you know, some people, um, you know, you, you can see movements like this playing out all over the world right now. So you construct a kind of devil, a kind of source of evil, well, and we're going yeah. to transcend beyond it. Yeah, we're, and, we're and the, the millenarian, the millenarians kind of, when you see a millenarian cult, they put a really <laughs> specific point on it, which is end of the world, right? There, there, is, there is some change coming, and that change that's coming is so profound and so important that it's either going to lead to utopia or hell mm -hmm. on earth, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it is going to, and then, you know, it's like, what if you actually knew that that was going to happen, right? What would you, what, what would you do, right? How would you prepare yourself for it? How would you come together with a group of like-minded people? Right. How would you, what would you do? Would you plan like caches of weapons in the woods? Would you like, you know, I don't know if it's create under, underground bunkers. Would you, you know, spend your life trying to figure out a way to avoid having it happen? Yeah. That's a really compelling, exciting idea to, uh, to have a club over, yeah. to have, to, to have a, to have a little bit of tribe, like a get together on a Saturday night and drink some beers and talk about the, the end of the world and how you, the, you are the only ones who have figured it out. And then, and then once you lock in on that, like, how can you do anything else with your life? Like, this is obviously the thing that you have to do. And then, and then there's a psychological effect you alluded to. There's a psychological effect where if you take a set of true believers and you leave them to themselves, they get more radical, right? Because they, they self-radicalize each other. That said, yes. it doesn't mean they're not sometimes oh, right. Yeah, the end of the world might be, yes, correct. Like, they might be right. Yeah. But like, we I have some pamphlets for you. <laughs> <laughs> But it's. It, I mean, there's. I mean, we'll talk about nuclear weapons because you have a really interesting little moment that I learned about in in your essay. But you know, sometimes it could be right. Yeah. Because we're still, you were developing more and more powerful technologies, 
uh, in, in this case, and we don't know what the impact they will have on human civilization. Well, we can highlight all the different predictions about how it will be positive, but the risks are there, and you discuss some of them. Well, the steel man, the steel man is the steel man. Well, actually, the steel man and his refutation are the same, which is well, you can't predict what's going to happen, right? You right, you, you can't rule out that this will not end everything, right? But the response to that is you have just made a completely non scientific claim. Yeah, you've made a religious claim, not a scientific claim. There How is, does it get disproven? There is, and there's no by definition with these kinds of claims, there's no way to disprove them. Yeah, right. Um, and so there, there's no. You, you just go right on the list. There's no hypothesis. There's no testability of the hypothesis. There's no um, way to falsify the hypothesis. There's no way to measure progress along the arc. Like it's just all completely missing, and so it's not scientific. And well, I don't. I don't think it's completely missing. It's it's somewhat missing. So, for example, the the the, the people that say AI is going to kill all of us. I mean, they usually have ideas about how to do that. Whether it's the paperclip maximizer or um, you know it escapes. There's mechanism by which you can imagine it killing all humans. Yeah. Models and. To, you can disprove it by saying there is a, there is a limit to uh, the speed at which intelligence increases. Maybe show that, uh, like the sort of rigorously really described model, like how it could happen, and say no, there here's a physics limitation. There's like a physical limitation to how these systems would actually do damage to human civilization. And it is possible they will kill 10 to 20% of the population, but it seems impossible for them to kill uh, 99%. There's practical counter arguments, right? So you mentioned basically what I described as the thermodynamic counter argument, which is so sitting here today, it's like, where would the evil AGI get the GPUs? Yeah. Because like they don't exist. Yep. <laughs> so you're going to have a very frustrated baby evil AGI who's yeah. going to be like trying to buy NVIDIA stock or something to <laughs> get them to finally make some chips. Um, yeah. Right. So the, the, the serious form of that is the thermodynamic argument, which is like, okay, where's the energy going to come from? Where's the processor going to be running? Where's the data center going to be happening? How is this going to be happening in secret such that you know it's not, you know, so, so that's a practical counter argument to the runaway AGI thing. I, I have a, but I have a, and we can argue that, uh, discuss that. I have, I have a deeper objection to it, which is it's, this is all forecasting. It's all modeling. It's all, it's all future prediction. It's all future hypothesizing. Mm -hmm. It's not science. Sure. It is not, it is, it is, it is, it is the opposite of science. So the, I'll pull up Carl Sagan, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof, right? These are extraordinary claims. The policies that are being called for, right, to prevent this are of extraordinary magnitude. That, and I think we're going to cause extraordinary damage. And this is all being done on the basis of something that is literally not scientific. It's not a testable hypothesis. So the moment you say AI is going to kill all of us, therefore we should ban it or that yeah. we should uh, regulate it, all that kind of stuff, that's when it starts getting serious. Or start, you know, military airstrikes on data centers. Oh, boy. Right? And like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's when it gets starts. Well, so, it starts getting real. So weird. here's the problem with millionaire and cults. They have a hard time staying away from violence. Yeah, but violence is so fun. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> if you're on the right end of it. They have a hard time avoiding violence. The reason they have a hard time avoiding violence is if you actually believe the claim, yeah. right, then what would you do to stop the end of the world? Well, you would do anything, right? Yeah. And so, and this is where you get, and again, if you just look at the history of, of, of millenary and cults, this is where you get the people's temple and everybody killing themselves in the jungle. And this is where you get Charles Manson and, you know, sending in to kill, kill the pigs. Like this is the problem with these. They, they have a very hard time drawing the line at actual violence. And I think, the, I think in this case, there's there, I mean, they're already calling for it like today and yeah. uh, you know, where this goes from here as they get more worked up, like I, I think is like really concerning. Okay. But that's kind of the extremes, you know, the extremes of anything are always, concerning it, it's also possible to kind of believe that ai has a very high likelihood of killing all of us uh but there's and therefore we should uh maybe consider uh slowing development or regulating so not violence or any of these kinds of things but saying like all right let's let's take a pause here you know you know, biological weapons nuclear weapons like whoa, 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 whoa. this is like serious stuff we should be careful. So it, it is possible to kind of have a more rational response, right? If you believe this risk is real. Believe. Yes. So what, is it possible to be have a scientific <laughs> approach to the, the the prediction of the future? I mean, we just went through this with COVID. Yeah. What do we know about modeling? Well, I mean- What okay. do we learn about modeling with COVID? Uh, there's a lot of lessons. They didn't work at all. They worked poorly. The models were terrible. The models were useless. I don't know if the models were useless or the 
people interpreting the models and then the centralized institutions that were creating policy rapidly based on the models and leveraging the models in order to uh, support their narratives versus actually interpreting the air bars and the models and all that kind of stuff. What you had with COVID, my, my view, what you had with COVID is you had these experts showing up. Um, they claimed to be scientists and they had no testable hypotheses whatsoever. They had a bunch of models. Um, they had a bunch of forecasts and they had a bunch of theories and they laid these out in front of policymakers and policymakers freaked out and panicked, right? And implemented a whole bunch of like really like terrible decisions that we're still living with the consequences of. Mm -hmm. um, and there was never any empirical foundation to any of the models. None of them ever came true. Yeah, to push to push back, there were certainly Baptists and bootleggers in this in the context of uh, this pandemic. But there's still a usefulness to models, no? I, I, so not if they're not, I mean not if they're reliably wrong, right? Then they're actually like anti-useful, right? They're actually damaging. But what, what do you do with a pandemic? What do you do with a with a with any kind of threat? Don't you want to kind of have? Um, several models to play with as part of the discussion of like, what the hell do we do here? I mean, do they work? Like, is there an expectation that they actually like work, that they have actual predictive value? I mean, as far as I can tell with COVID, we just sigh out, the, the policymakers just sigh up themselves into believing that there was substance. I mean, look, the, the scientists, it's, the scientists were at fault. This, the quote unquote scientists showed yeah. up. Mm -hmm. So I had some insight into this. So there, there was a, remember the Imperial College models out of, out yes. of London were the ones that were like, these are the gold standard models. Yeah. So a friend of mine runs a big software company and he was like, wow, this is like COVID's really scary. And he's like, you know, he contacted this research and he's like, you know, do you need some help? You've been just building this model on your own for 20 years. Do you need some, would you like us, our coders to basically restructure it so it can be fully adapted for COVID? And, the guy said yes and sent over the code. And my friend said it was like the worst spaghetti code he's ever seen. That doesn't mean it's not possible to construct a good model of pandemic with the correct error bars with a high number of parameters that are continuously many times a day updated as we get more data about a pandemic. I would like to believe when a pandemic hits the world, the best computer scientists in the world, the best software engineers respond aggressively and as input, take the data that we know about the virus and as an output, say, here's here's what's happening in terms of how quickly it's spreading, what that lead in terms of hospitalization and deaths and all that kind of stuff. Here's how likely, how contagious it likely is. Here's how deadly it likely is based on different conditions, based on different ages and demographics and all that kind of stuff. So here's the best kinds of policy. It feels like you can have models, machine learning, <laughs> that like kind of they don't perfectly predict the future but they 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 help you do something because there's pandemics that are like uh meh they don't really do much harm and there's pandemics you can imagine them they could do a huge amount of harm mm -hmm. like they can kill a lot of people so you should probably have some kind of data driven models that keep updating that allow you to make decisions that based like where how bad is this thing uh, now you can criticize <laughs> how horrible all that went with the response to this pandemic, but I just feel like there might be some value to models. So to be useful, at some point it has to be predictive, right? So and so and and the, so the easy thing for me to do is to say, obviously you're right. Obviously, I want to see that just as much as you do, because anything that makes it easier to navigate through society through a wrenching, you know, risk like that is, you know, sound, that sounds great. Um, you know, the, the the harder objection to it is just simply you are trying to model a complex dynamic system with eight billion moving parts, like. Yeah. Not possible. It's very tough. Can't be done. Complex systems can't be done. Uh, machine learning says hold my beer, but well, uh, it's possible. No, like, I don't know. I, I would like to believe that it is. Yeah, uh, I'll put it this way. I think where you and I would agree is I think we would like we would we would like that to be the case. We are strongly in favor of it. I think we would also agree that no such thing, with respect to COVID or pandemics, no such thing, at least neither you nor I think are aware. Of, I'm not aware of anything like that today. My main worry with the response to the pandemic is that uh, uh, same as with aliens is that even if such a thing existed, and it's possible it existed, the the the, the policymakers were not paying attention. Like uh, there was no mechanism that allowed those kinds of models to percolate up. Oh, I think we had the opposite problem during COVID. I think the policymakers, I think the, the, these, the, these, these people with basically fake science had too much access to the policymakers. Well, right, and well, but the policymakers also wanted, they had a narrative in mind and they also wanted to use whatever model that fit that narrative oh, sure. to, to help them out. So like, it felt like there was a lot of politics and not enough science. Yeah, although a big part of what was happening, a big a rigor reason we got lockdowns for as long as we did was because these scientists came in with these like doomsday scenarios that were like, just like completely off the hook. Scientists in quotes, Sci that's not- Quote, quote unquote scientists. That's not- Okay. Let's give love so here's to science. The that is the way out. 
Science is a process of testing hypotheses. Yeah. Modeling does not involve testable hypotheses, right? Like I, I don't even know that mo- I actually don't, I don't, I don't even know that modeling actually qualifies as science. Maybe that's a, a side conversation we could have sometime uh, over a beer. Uh, it's a really interesting, but what do we do about the future? I mean, what, what? So number one is when we start with number one, humility it goes back to this thing of how do we determine the truth? Number two is we don't believe, you know, it's the old, I've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Um, uh, I've got, a, oh, uh, I, this is one of the reasons I gave you, I gave uh, Lex a book, um, uh, which the topic of the book is what happens when scientists basically stray off the path yeah. of technical knowledge and start to weigh in on politics and societal issues. Um, in this case, philosophers. Well, in this case, philosophers, but he, he actually talks in this book about like Einstein, he talks about actually about the nuclear age and Einstein, he talks about the physicists uh, actually uh, uh, doing the, doing uh, very similar things at the time. Uh, the book is When Reason Goes on Holiday, Philosophers and politics by uh nevin and it's just a story it's a story there's there are other books on this topic but this is a new one that's really good it's just a story of what happens when experts in a certain domain decide to weigh in and become basically social engineers and um and uh, political um you know basically political advisors and it's just a story of just unending catastrophe right and i think that's what happened with COVID again yeah i found this book a highly entertaining and eye-opening read filled with amazing anecdotes of irrationality and craziness by famous recent philosophers this uh, it, definitely after you read this book you will not look at einstein the same oh boy yeah <laughs> don't destroy my heroes you, you will not be a hero of yours anymore um i'm sorry you probably should, you shouldn't read the book all right but here's the thing the ai the ai risk people they don't even have the COVID model at least yeah. not that i'm aware of no like there's not even the equivalent of the COVID model they don't even have the spaghetti code They've got a theory and a, a warning and a this and a that. And like, if you ask like, okay, well, here's, here's, yeah, I mean, the, the ultimate example is, okay, how do we know, right? How do we know that an AI is running away? Like, how do we know that the foom takeoff thing is actually happening? And the only answer that any of these guys have given that I've ever seen is, oh, it's when the loss uh, rate, the loss uh, function in the, in the training drops, right? That's when you need to like shut down the data center, right? And it's like, well, that's also what happens when you're successfully training a model, like, like what what even is this is not science <laughs> this is not it's not anything it's not a model it's not anything there's yeah. nothing to arguing with it is like you know punching jello like there, there's what do you even respond to uh, so just put push back on that i don't think they have good metrics of yeah when the foom is happening but i think it's possible to have that like i just just as, as you speak now i mean it's possible to imagine there could be measures it's been 20 years no for sure but it's been only weeks since we had a big enough breakthrough in language models. We can start to actually have this. The thing is, the AI Doomer stuff didn't have any actual systems to really work with. And now there's real systems you can start to analyze, like, how does this stuff go wrong? And I think you kind of agree that there is a lot of risks that we can analyze. The benefits outweigh the risks in many cases. Well, the risks are not existential. Yes. Well, not in the not not in the foom, not in the foom paper clip. Not in this. So let me. Okay. There's another sleight of hand that you just alluded to. Yep. There's another sleight of hand that happens, which is very. I think I'm very good at the sleight of hand thing, <laughs> which is very not scientific. So, the book Superintelligence, right, okay. which is like the Nick Bostrom's book, which is like the origin of a lot of this stuff, which yep. was written, you know, whatever, ten years ago or something. So he does this really fascinating thing in the book, which is he basically says um, uh, there are many possible routes to machine intelligence, um, to artificial intelligence. And he describes all the different routes to artificial intelligence, all the different possible, everything from biological augmentation through to, you know, that, all these different things. Um, one of the ones that he does not describe is large language models, because, of course, the book was written before they were invented, and so they didn't exist. In the book, he de- he describes them all, and then he proceeds to treat them all as if they're exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. He presents them all as sort of an equivalent risk to be dealt with in an equivalent way to be thought sure. about the same way. And then the risk, the quote unquote risk that's actually emerged is actually a completely different technology than he was even imagining. And yet all of his theories and beliefs are being transplanted by this movement, like straight onto this new technology. And so again, like there's no other area of science or technology where you do that. Yeah. Like when you're dealing with like organic chemistry versus inorganic chemistry, you don't just like say, oh, with respect to like either one basically maybe you know growing up and eating the world or something like they're just going to operate the same way like you don't but you can start talking about like as as we get more and more actual systems that start to get more and more intelligent you can start to actually have more scientific arguments here like you know high level you can talk about the threat of autonomous weapon systems back before we had any automation in in the military and that would be like very fuzzy kind of logic but the more and more you have drones they're becoming more and more autonomous you can start imagining okay what does that actually look like and what's the actual threat of autonomous weapon systems how does it go wrong and still it's 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 very vague but you start to get a sense of like all right 
um, it should probably be illegal or, or wrong or not allowed to do like mass deployment of fully autonomous drones that are doing aerial strikes oh, no, I, on large areas. I think it should be required. Right. So that's no, a, no, no, no. I think it should be required that only aerial vehicles are automated. Okay. So you want to go the other way? I want to go the other way. So, so that, okay. I think it's obvious that the machine is going to make a better decision than the human pilot. I think it's obvious that it's in the best interest of both the attacker and the defender and humanity at large if machines are making more of these decisions and not people. I think people make terrible decisions in times of war. But like there's a, there's ways this can go wrong too, right? Well, it's, it's, wars go terribly wrong now. This goes back to the, this is that whole thing about like the self-driving, does the self-driving car need to be perfect versus does it need to be better than the human driver? Yeah. Does the automated drone need to be perfect or does it need to be, need, need to be better than a human pilot at making decisions under enormous amounts of stress and uncertainty? Yeah. Well, the, on average, right. the, the worry that AI folks have is the runaway. They're going to come alive, right? That, then again, that's the sleight of hand, right? It's or the, not, not come alive. Well, no, hold on a second. You become, come, you lose control. You lose control a, but then they're going to develop goals of their own. They're going to develop a mind of their own. They're going to develop their own, right? No, more, more like a uh, Chernobyl style meltdown, like uh, just bugs in the code accidentally you know force you the, the, the results in the bombing of like large civilian areas okay and to, to a degree that's not possible um in the in the current uh military strategies i don't know controlled by humans well actually we've been doing a lot of mass bombings of cities for a very long time yes and a lot of civilians died and a lot of civilians died and if you watch the documentary the fog of war mcnamara it spends a big part of it talking about the fire bombing of the japanese cities yeah burning them straight to the ground yeah. Right, the, the devastation in Japan, the American military uh, firebombing the cities in Japan was a considerably bigger devastation than the use of nukes, right? So we've been doing that for a long time. We, did, we also did that to Germany, by the way, Germany did that to, to us, right? Like that's an old tradition. The minute we got airplanes, we started doing indiscriminate bombing. So one of the things- We're that still doing it. The modern US uh, military can do with technology, with automation, but technology more broadly is uh, higher and higher precision strikes. Precision. Yeah. Oh, and so precision is obviously precision, and this is the the, the the JDAM, right? So there was this big advance, this big advance um, called the JDAM, which basically was strapping a GPS transceiver to a to a to an unguided bomb and turning it into a guided guided bomb. And yeah, that's great. Like, look, that's been a big advance. But it, and that's like a baby version of this question, which is okay. Do you want like the human pilot like guessing where the bomb's going to land, or do you want like the machine like guiding the bomb to its destination? Uh, that's a baby version of the question. The next version of the question is, do you want the human or the machine deciding whether to drop the bomb? Everybody just assumes the human's going to do a better job for what I think are fundamentally suspicious reasons. Emotional, psychological yeah, reasons. I think it's very clear that the machine's going to do a better job making that decision because the hum humans making that making that decision are god awful. Just terrible. Yeah. Right. And so so yeah, so this is the this is the thing. And then let's get to the there was can I one more sleight of hand? Yes. It was sure. in, okay. <laughs> Please. I'm a magician, you could say. One more sleight of hand. These things are going to be so smart right? That they're going to be able to destroy the world and wreak havoc and like do all this stuff and plan and do all this stuff and evade us and have all their secret things and their secret factories and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But they're so stupid that they're going to get like tangled up in their code. And that's the, th they're not going to come alive, but there's going to be some bug that's going to cause them to like turn us all into paper. Yeah. Like that they're not going to, that they're going to be genius in every way other than the actual bad goal. And it's just uh, like, and that's just like a like ridiculous like discrepancy. And and the, and 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 you can prove this today. You can actually address this today for the first time with LLMs, which is you can actually ask LLMs to resolve uh, moral dilemmas. Yeah. So you can create the scenario. You know, dot dot dot. This that this that this that. What would you as the AI do in this circumstance? And they don't just say destroy all humans, destroy all humans. Mm -hmm. They will give you actually very nuanced moral, practical, trade off oriented answers. Mm -hmm. And so we actually already have the kind of AI that can actually like think this through and can actually like you know reason about goals. Well, the the hope is uh, that AGI or like uh, very super intelligent systems have some of the nuance that LLMs have. And the intuition is they most likely will because even these LLMs have the nuance. Uh, LLMs are really, this is actually worth worth um, spending a moment on. LLMs are really interesting to have moral conversations with. Mm -hmm. And that, I, was just, I didn't expect I'd be having a moral conversation with a machine in my yeah. lifetime. Well, and, and let's remember, we're not really having a conversation with a machine. We're, we're having a conversation with the entirety of the collective intelligence of the human species. Exactly. Yes, yeah. correct. But it's possible to imagine autonomous weapon systems that are not using LLMs. But if they're smart enough to be scary, why are they not smart enough to be wise? 
Like that's the part where it's like, I, I don't know how you get the one without the other. Is it possible to be super intelligent without being super wise? Well, you're, again, you're back to that. I mean, then you're back to a classic autistic computer, right? Like you're back to just like a, a blind rule follower. I've got this like core, it's the paperclip thing. I've got this core rule and I'm just going to follow it to the end of the earth. And it's like, well, but everything you're going to be doing to execute that rule is going to be super genius level that humans aren't going to be able to counter. It's, it's just a, it's a, yeah. it's, it's a mismatch in the definition of, of what the system is capable of. Unlikely, but not impossible, I think. But again, here you get to like, okay, like. <laughs> no, no but I'm not saying when it's unlikely, but not impossible. If it's unlikely, that means the, the fear should be correctly calibrated. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof.